EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled The Grand Theft Propeller. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management. He has authored and authors numerous aviation articles for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, the ANP mechanic certificate with the inspection authorization. 2008, he was the FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, and Mike's a member of EAA, volunteering his time to be with us tonight, sharing this information. Mike, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm was a little bit worried about tonight because uh, about two days two days ago, I had a ripping case of laryngitis, but uh, it uh, seems to have resolved. And so, uh, uh, hopefully, my voice will will will, will last the duration. Um, tonight's uh, presentation. Um, a fairly short one, and it's based on a, uh, as as many of my uh, webinars are, uh, based on a, on an interesting uh, thing that happened to me uh, a few months ago. Um, I I got a call from uh, from a um, an A and P mechanic. Um, he introduced himself as as a fairly experienced A and P, but had only recently um, gotten his IA, and so was fairly new to the process of of doing annual inspections. Um, <clears throat> and he uh, he was looking for some advice on a situation that he was confronting. Uh, he had just um, finished doing an annual inspection on a uh, 1950s vintage Piper Pacer uh, that uh, a customer had brought him for an annual inspection. And um, in the course of the inspection of the aircraft, he um, determined that the propeller was in a seriously corroded uh, condition. Um, it, was, it was a real mess. The, the, the airplane was, was basically fairly sound, but this propeller uh, was creating a big problem for him. Uh, and in fact, he, he made the determination not only that the propeller was unairworthy, but he suspected that it was so badly corroded that it was probably unrepairable. So he advised the owner of the, of this Piper Pacer that, um, uh, that he was not going to be able to sign off the annual as airworthy, uh, with that propeller and that the, uh, the owner was going to have to um, uh, purchase a, another propeller for the aircraft, either a new one or a service, one in serviceable condition. <clears throat> now, as you might expect, the, the owner was not thrilled with this verdict, um, but ultimately he agreed uh, to, uh, uh, to, to pay for a replacement uh, propeller for the aircraft. And in the course of his discussions with the IA, he he um, indicated that he he wanted the IA to give him the bad propeller back. Um, the IA was kind of curious about that. He he asked he asked the owner why he wanted his propeller back, and the owner said that he he wanted to list it on eBay and 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 hopefully recoup some of the cost of of buying the replacement prop for his airplane. Um, upon hearing this, the, the IA was horrified, and he told the owner, well, you can't do that. You can't put your that, that prop up on eBay. What if somebody were to buy it from you and put it on an airplane and it failed in flight? Um, the, uh, the owner uh, uh, was not moved by that. Uh, that argument and indicated that that he wanted the, his propeller back and he wanted to list it on eBay and that that the IA had no right to 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 hold it. Um, the IA 
said that he he wasn't going to release it because he wasn't going to take responsibility for that airplane for that that propeller getting back into circulation and the argument between the two escalated <clears throat> ultimately the uh the ia wound up uh, uh, some colleague of his suggested that the ia give me a call and, and get my advice so i listened as the IA explained the situation to me. It was obvious that there was a lot of passion in his voice. And when he was done telling me his story, I took a deep breath and I said to him, what are you thinking? <laughs> it's not your prop, it's his prop. It's the aircraft owner's prop. You have no right to hold it. And if you don't give it back to him, he could file a police complaint against you for theft. Give the man his prop back. The IA uh, still wasn't happy with this. He, he says, but he says he's going to sell it on eBay. What if somebody buys it and crashes and into a, you know, into a schoolyard full of kids and uh, the, the authorities wind up tracing this bad propeller uh, back to, uh, to, to the annual I did on this airplane. I'm going to be in all sorts of trouble. <clears throat> and, you know, it was very clear that the IA didn't, and, and it was understandable, he was a, a relatively new IA, but he didn't have a clear understanding of what an IA's responsibility is when somebody brings an aircraft for an annual inspection. Um, I explained to him as patiently as I could that the owner hired him to perform an annual inspection, that he did perform the annual inspection, he determined that the prop was unairworthy. He informed the owner that the prop was unairworthy. And that was the end of his responsibility. What the owner does about that is his affair. It's not the mechanic's job to, to determine what the owner is going to do about the unairworthy propeller. It's only to inspect the aircraft and make a determination as to whether the aircraft was airworthy or not. And in this case, the, air, the aircraft was not airworthy because the propeller was not airworthy, pretty clearly not airworthy. Um, in, order to, in order to underscore this point, I, I asked the IA to conduct a little thought experiment. I said, suppose the owner had not agreed to replace the corroded propeller what would you have done then? Well, what you would have done is signed off his annual as unairworthy and handed him a discrepancy list that said the propeller is unairworthy because it's extensively corroded. At that point, you'd have given him an invoice, he'd have paid the invoice, you'd give him back his airplane with the bad prop bolted onto it, um, and then it would be up to the owner what to do about the situation. Um, your obligation was to do the inspection. It wasn't to make a decision as to what to do about the fact that the prop was unairworthy. <clears throat> I explained that as an IA, um, he could not force the, the owner to repair his unairworthy aircraft. And assuming that he paid the IA for his work doing the inspection, he had no authority to hold the aircraft or to hold any part of it. Um, it wasn't his, it was the owner's. <clears throat> um, and I run into this quite a bit. This was a pretty, uh, uh, a, uh, a pretty dramatic misunderstanding. But, but I find that that mechanics don't have a clear understanding of where the boundary line is between what they are responsible for and what aircraft owners are responsible for. <clears throat> um, the FARs make that pretty clear. Um, what the FARs say is that the owner is responsible for what maintenance is done and when it is done. And mechanics are responsible for how it is done. Um, <clears throat> when a mechanic does work on an airplane, he has to do it um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a proper fashion in compliance with the regulations. Most cases, <clears throat> he, 
He has to follow the manufacturer's instructions for how to do it. Um, but it's not up to the mechanic to decide what maintenance is done or when it should be done. That is, that's the aircraft owner's job. And <clears throat> when it comes to making an airworthiness determination, um, the regulations, 91409 in particular, require us to hire an IA if it's a certificated aircraft or some some appropriate person if it's if it's an experimental aircraft to make a determination of airworthiness or in the case of experimental aircraft a determination of whether the aircraft is in safe condition for flight <clears throat> and we have to do that once every 12 calendar months the rest of the time, the other 364 days of the year, it's the pilot in command who's responsible for determining whether the aircraft is airworthy. <clears throat> and um, I've mentioned before, I think, uh, in, in, in some of my webinars, that this is very much the way um, aviation medicals work, that once every so many years, we're required to go to a doctor to get certified as as being as being airworthy to be a pilot but the rest of the time we self-certify and that's the way it works with aircraft as well so in the case of this aircraft it was the ia's responsibility to determine that the propeller was unairworthy which he did and it was the owner's responsibility to decide what to do about it now, the owner had a number of options uh, that he could have exercised in uh, in response to the IA's determination that the prop was unairworthy. He could have tried to find another mechanic to inspect the prop and to declare it airworthy because airworthiness is, airworthiness is not an absolute. Maybe this IA thought the prop was unairworthy but another IA might come to a different conclusion. <clears throat> I, I, in fact, I recently had a call from a from an aircraft owner who um, who owned a, a, a Cherokee 180. Um, he had had a repair to the stabilator of that aircraft some years ago, and it had gone through numerous annual inspections in which the repair had been inspected and determined to be airworthy. But this year he took it to another IA who inspected it and said the repair was not airworthy and proposed uh, that, that the stabilizer be taken apart and some fairly extensive structural changes made to it. The owner said, well, how can this repair be unairworthy now when it was found to be airworthy for the last five years. And I explained that there's, there was nothing wrong with that, that airworthiness is not an absolute. Airworthiness is in the eye of the inspector and it's perfectly okay for one IA to determine that something is unairworthy and another IA to determine that it is airworthy. There's a significant a subjective element to airworthiness. So <clears throat> one option is always that an owner has is always to try to find another qualified inspector to uh, who, who who determines that the thing that the, the first inspector considered to be unairworthy is actually airworthy. And that was his, that was always his option. <clears throat> and in fact Presumably, if he took it back to the guy who did the last year's annual, that, that guy would have said, oh, yeah, that, that repairs just fine. A second option he had was to try to find a prop shop to repair it, even though the IA felt that he, it probably was not repairable. <clears throat> the IA might have been right, but only a prop shop could make that determination. And a third option, which is the option he ultimately chose, was to replace it with an airworthy prop. But it's up to the owner to decide what to do about the unairworthy item. It's not up to the IA. 
<clears throat> now there is a there is a regulation ninety one seven that says no person may fly an unairworthy aircraft. So the owner couldn't just take this take the aircraft with the unairworthy prop and go fly it off into the sunset unless he obtained a, a ferry permit. And to obtain a ferry permit, he he would need to find an A&P who was willing to make a logbook entry that stated at least that the aircraft was in a, a condition to make the ferry flight safely. Um, so there's an there's an FAR that 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 says that we're not allowed to fly on air with the aircraft. It's a very basic FAR 917. But there's no FAR that empowers a mechanic to ground an airplane. The A and P's are not safety police. Some of them think they are, but that's not what their responsibility is or their authority. <clears throat> now there are safety police. Um, and they're called airworthiness safety inspectors. They work for the FAA at one of the ADFAA FISDOs around the country, Flight Standards District offices. And those guys are the safety police. And in, in particular, an airworthiness safety inspector who works for a FISDO has the authority to ramp check an airplane and to hang on that airplane a document called an aircraft condition notice, which requires that an unsafe condition be corrected before further flight. Um, here's what here's what what a aircraft condition notice looks like. It's an FAA form 8620-1, and um, and in particular, uh, it, if if the inspector checks off the right check boxes on that form, it <clears throat> it will, can require the operator of the aircraft to uh, to repair a specified unsafe condition before further flight. Um, but not even an airworthiness safety inspector, not even an FAA employee has the authority or, or any regulatory basis for confiscating an unairworthy uh, component. Um, there's no requirement, for example, for a propeller that has been removed from an airplane to be airworthy. There are lots of good uses for unairworthy propellers, um, hanging them on, a, on an airboat, uh, hanging them on a plaque on the wall are perfectly appropriate uses for something like that. Um, we're, we're just not allowed to, uh, to put them on an airplane and fly. Now, a vindictive mechanic uh, who was bound and determined to uh, prevent uh, an, uh, an unairworthy airplane from flying could conceivably pick up the phone and call an airworthiness safety inspector at the FISDO and ask that he come out to inspect the aircraft and hang a condition notice on it. Um, the, 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 uh, the mechanic or IA doesn't have that authority, but he could presumably call somebody at the FAA to say, would you come out and ground this airplane? Um, that would not be a very nice thing to do. That would be like, uh, calling the cops to complain that your neighbor is playing a stereo too loud instead of calling the neighbor and asking him nicely to turn it down. So, you know, in, in, in my opinion, a mechanic who would call the cops on one of his paying clients, except in the most extraordinary circumstances, um, should be avoided like the plague. And then I would think that if a mechanic did something like that, and a word got out that no aircraft owner would, would want to take their aircraft to, to him again. That is really not a very nice thing to do. You know, if the mechanic wants to be the safety police, then he should go work, go to work for the FAA. If he's, if he's working for aircraft owners and he's taking their money, his, 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 uh, he, he should, he, he should be doing what's right by the aircraft owner and not, not calling the cops on them. Um, so just to, to summarize, when it comes to maintenance, owners are responsible for 
uh, excuse me, there's a, there, there's a typo on that slide. Owners are responsible for what maintenance is done and when it is done. Mechanics are responsible for how it's done. They're re- responsible for doing the maintenance in a competent fashion. Uh, only the maintenance that the aircraft owner asks them to do. <clears throat> and the uh, Air Women and Safety Inspector at the FISDO is the safety police, and, and he has enforcement powers, but mechanics do not have enforcement powers. And things work best when he, each person knows their role and, and, and acts properly w- within that area of responsibility. Um, what I find in practice is that owners, although they have a lot of authority uh, under the regulations, often don't accept that authority and don't um, uh, don't exercise it um, in the way they they can and should. And the mechanics tend to pick up the slack and take responsibility for things that they're not properly responsible for. Um, and the best you know, antidote for that is for owners and mechanics both to clearly understand uh, where the, what the dividing line is and, uh, and what each one is responsible for. <clears throat> so Tim, that's, that's all the prepared material I have uh, tonight, but I'd be glad to, uh, to open it up for questions. Okay, Mike, we got a couple questions that have come in. So let's start off with Jack's. Jack says, I occasionally hear of aircraft records being held ransom by a mechanic or service center. Is the legal environment for that similar to the grand theft prop situation we're talking about tonight? Absolutely. And um, that's something that unfortunately happens from time to time. Um, the, the maintenance records are not the property of a mechanic. They are clearly the property of the aircraft owner. Um, mechanics are required by regs to, to make certain maintenance record entries, um, and provide them to the aircraft owner. Uh, it is the aircraft owner's responsibility to, um, verify that the required maintenance record entries have been made and then to keep the maintenance record entries for a a specified period of time. And there are various kinds of maintenance record entries. Um, Entries, for example, of annual inspections or uh, ordinary um, uh, repairs and alterations and preventive maintenance are required to be kept for a maximum of one year or until the same uh, task has been repeated. So <clears throat> you're required to keep the record of an oil change um, for either a year or uh, when the next oil change is performed. There are certain records that are required to be kept permanently, um, records of airworthiness directive compliance, for example, uh, and certain other kinds of things. Um, have to be kept uh, permanently and actually transferred to a new owner when the aircraft is sold. But the majority of maintenance records are required to be kept for a year. Um, <clears throat> we normally don't throw them out after a year, but you could do that uh, and it would be perfectly legal. Um, but the, re- the, the obligation for maintaining maintenance records is purely on the owner of the aircraft. And mechanics have no right to hold maintenance records hostage, but because it happens <clears throat> and because mechanics also have been known to lose maintenance records um, uh, or have maintenance records, um, you know, burn up in a fire or get lost in a flood, what we recommend to our managed maintenance clients is that they never allow their original maintenance records um, to leave their their, their, their own physical custody. Um, <clears throat> we provide copies of the maintenance records to mechanics and we ask mechanics to make their maintenance record entries on self-adhesive stickers that the owner can paste into their logbooks. Um, but we never like to allow the original maintenance records to leave the owner's hands and we 
recommend that they keep them locked up in a fireproof safe someplace. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the fair market value of an aircraft uh, tends to be greatly devalued if the maintenance records are lost. <clears throat> and some mechanics who don't know better will hold maintenance records as leverage over an aircraft owner that they're having a dispute with. For, for example, um, if the owner is fighting with a mechanic over paying a bill, mechanics will tend to hold aircraft maintenance records. <clears throat> they probably can do that on the basis that the maintenance records are really part of the aircraft. And in most states, a mechanic could take out a mechanic's lien on an aircraft if he's worked on the aircraft and, and not been paid for it. <clears throat> but it's not a good idea to give a mechanic that leverage. So we never allow our owners to, uh, to, to let their maintenance records out of their, their own physical custody. And there's no reason that that should ever be necessary. That's even true if the FAA asks for records. If you, if, if you get ramp checked and an inspector asks you for your maintenance records, you don't have to provide him the originals. You can provide him with copies and you only have to provide him those portions of the records that you're required to keep. So that for most records is, is only the last year worth, year's worth of records. James is wondering, is it proper for an IA to use the aircraft logbook to record the list of discrepancies he finds during inspection if he does not sign off the aircraft as airworthy? No, it's improper to do that. Um, the, the, if an annual inspection is signed off as unairworthy with discrepancies, the discrepancies should be documented on a separate sheet of paper signed and dated by the mechanic and, and presented to the, uh, uh, to the aircraft owner. And the reason it needs to be on a separate piece of paper is because of the retention requirements in the regulations for such discrepancy lists are very, very different than, than the retention uh, requirements for other maintenance entries. Uh, <clears throat> the, the logbook entry that says that the aircraft was inspected in accordance with an annual inspection has to be kept for at least a year or until the next annual. But the discrepancy list doesn't have to be kept any longer than it takes for the discrepancies to be cleared. So to combine the two is improper um, since the owner is permitted under the regulations to dispose of the discrepancy list once the discrepancies are resolved, uh, it should definitely be on a separate sheet of paper, not as part of the aircraft's maintenance records. Mitchell's wondering, uh, in your example, could the IA have signed off the inspection as unairworthy with respect to the prop, and then the owner could bring the aircraft to another AMP who could then determine what repair, if any, needed to be made to the prop and then sign off the discrepancy after the repair, um, uh, if any, and return the aircraft to service? Um, <clears throat> well, certainly. Um, the, the, the question is, where is the other mechanic and how is he going to look at the airplane? If the if, if the um, owner did not want to replace the prop and he directed the IA that he did not want to replace the prop and to sign off the annual with a discrepancy, um, the IA would sign off the annual hand the, as unairworthy hand the uh, owner a discrepancy list that said the, prop the propeller is unairworthy because it's corroded. And then the owner would would then be able to get any authorized mechanic, not even, not necessarily an IA, to inspect the prop and clear the discrepancy if the, if the uh, mechanic determined that the prop was airworthy or to repair the prop if it was repairable. Um, the, the, the only problem is that if he could not get such a person to 
come to the airplane where it was and he needed to fly it somewhere else, he couldn't do that without a ferry permit. And to get a ferry permit, as I said earlier, he would have to get some mechanic to sign a log book entry that said that he had inspected the aircraft and considered it in condition to make the ferry flight safely, which is a very, very low standard, far, far below airworthiness, of course. Um, but he couldn't just jump in the airplane, go fly it to some other place without a ferry permit. We've had a At least few he couldn't people. do it legally. <laughs> right. We've some had a people, few people do it, but. We've had a few people wondering, uh, what was the outcome in this case? Did the owner finally put the prop up on eBay? What happened? Well, I didn't see, I didn't see the eBay listing, but, but, but the, the upshot was that, that after talking to me for a, a while, the, the IA decided that indeed he had no, uh, no right to hold the prop hostage. So he gave it back to the, to the owner. I presume the owner went ahead and listed it on eBay, but I'm not, I'm not certain of that. But he David, certainly had every right to do that. Yeah. David is uh, asking, is the aircraft owner entitled to any removed parts from their aircraft or does the shop keep it? Or is there an agreement made between the owner and the shop for removed parts to be given to the owner or kept by the shop? Well, the, the, you know, the owner should let the mechanic know what he wants. Um, uh, most shops will, 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 will toss removed parts in the trash if they, if they think they have no value, unless the owner asks for them back. If the owner asks for them back, he has every right to get them back. And the only exception to that would be <clears throat> if, um, if the shop um, acquires a part for the aircraft that requires a core to be sent back. Um, and if, if the part doesn't, if the, if the old part doesn't get sent back, then, then they don't get court credit for it. Um, but again, it's totally up to the aircraft owner, um, what's done with the parts that come off the airplane. And they, he certainly is entitled to any one, any of them that he wants. He just needs to make it clear. Okay. Brian is wondering if an FAA aviation safety inspectors issues an unairworthy card to the aircraft. Can the pilot correct the deficiency as in your example, uh, add air to the tire or must an AMP sign off the repair? No, the, 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 the repair can be done by any authorized person. And in, in the case to, of, uh, Adding air to the tire, certainly the the uh, the, the pilot in command could do that. Um, I mean, the, my, my example it was a little bit facetious because it would be very unlikely that a that an FAA inspector would hang a condition notice on an aircraft because because it had a, an underinflated tire, but it's possible. Um, there's a famous case of a of, of a, an inspector that 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 hung a uh, condition notice on an airplane. I think it was down at Hawthorne, California, years ago, right when uh, Hartzell first came out with their Q-tip props with it, that have the the funny uh, prop tips that were that that were uh, bent into little winglets and the. Uh, uh, aviation safety inspector not being particularly knowledgeable about this decided that that it had been in a prop strike and hung a condition notice on the aircraft and uh, he he got a lot of flag for that <laughs> Dominic is wondering uh, so let's say the annual is due by March 31st but you annual in January before it's actually due the IA says prop is not airworthy do you still need the ferry permit or can you fly it until March? Nope. You still need the ferry permit. Um, once, once an, an annual inspection starts, um, the previous annual inspection no longer has any validity to it. Um, <clears throat> the, the more general rule is 
that the act of committing maintenance on an aircraft um, grounds the aircraft, always grounds the aircraft. And the thing that ungrounds the aircraft is a signature um, on a maintenance record entry uh, approving the aircraft return to service. Whose signature that is depends on what maintenance was done. If the maintenance was an annual inspection, <clears throat> then the signature has to be an IA or, uh, or a uh, certified repair station. If the maintenance was a repair, um, a minor repair, then the signature could be an A&P mechanic. If the maintenance was preventive maintenance, then the signature conceivably could be the aircraft owner's signature exercising his preventive maintenance authority. Um, but the general rule is <clears throat> anytime you commit maintenance on an aircraft, uh, that grounds the aircraft. And the thing that ungrounds the aircraft is an authorized signature um, by somebody who is authorized to return the air, approve the aircraft for return to service after that particular kind of maintenance. So Brian is wondering uh, uh, about the ramifications from the adding air in the tire. He said, I add air to the tire, then crash later. What proof <laughs> do I have that I corrected the unairworthy condition that they had hung the paper on my plane for? Well, um, you probably don't have any proof for adding air to the tire because that's not considered to be maintenance operation. That's considered to be servicing. <clears throat> but if some, if, if an airworthiness safety inspector actually did uh, hang a condition notice on my airplane uh, saying that I had to inflate the or, uh, air up the tire before further flight, um, admittedly a very, very... Uh, unlikely uh, set of circumstances, <clears throat> I would air up the tire, take an iPhone photo and send it to the airworthiness safety inspector before I flew, just to put it on the record. <clears throat> Kurt, uh, it actually, asked. actually did happen to me oh, a few years ago. I, my airplane was parked in Pensacola, Florida for a week. <clears throat> and when I came out to it to fly home, um, there was a condition notice on it um, by some airworthiness safety inspector who noticed a chafed wire. And I looked at it, and sure enough, the, there was a chafed wire on it. The condition notice did not require that the condition be corrected before further flight. <clears throat> so I flew home. I did a really nice repair on the wire. I took a picture of it, and I sent it to the inspector. <laughs> Um, that's not required, but it's, it, was prob it was probably a good good thing to do, to just make it clear to the inspector that I was paying attention to, to his condition notice. Hmm. Kurt's wondering, uh, a local shop will not return to service an airplane with a constant speed prop that has been installed more than 10 years since overhaul, regardless of hours of condition. Ever heard of something like this? I have in Canada, um, <clears throat> but again, IAs have a tremendous amount of discretion. Um, they're, they're required to make an airworthiness determination. Airworthiness has two components. The aircraft has to be, has to comply with its type design and it has to be in condition for safe operation. <clears throat> there is no requirement in the United States for propeller TBOs to be complied with. So a prop that's, that hasn't been overhauled for 25 years is still compliant with its type design. Uh, the fact that it hasn't been overhauled for 25 years does, is, is not um, a type design issue. <clears throat> but an IA has to make also make a determination as to whether he feels that the aircraft is in condition for safe flight. And that's the subjective part of airworthiness. And some IAs aren't comfortable with, air, with, with propellers that haven't been overhauled for 25 years. So it's absolutely the IAs, within the IAs authority, to say, I don't consider this propeller to be in condition for safe flight. And so I can't sign off the, the annual as airworthy. 
That doesn't mean the owner has to overhaul the prop. It just means he has to go find somebody else with his head screwed on to say, yeah, the prop's fine. Um, and, and, and most aircraft owners don't understand that they can do that. And they, they, a lot of them, if an IA says, I can't sign off the annual and unless you do X, uh, and X is expensive or invasive or nasty, um, most owners don't understand that 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 doesn't mean they have to do X. It just means they have to go find somebody else who has a different opinion. And um, most owners, or a lot of owners, tend to feel that that the IA has them over a barrel. Um, but that's not true. That's not the way the the, the regulations are written. <clears throat> and you know, from time to time in our managed maintenance practice, we do ask shops to sign off an aircraft. Um, with discrepancies when they're taking an unreasonable position so that we can get the airplane out of that shop and take it to somebody who's more reasonable. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's why the regs are written the way they are. John is wondering, um, are there parameters uh, such as shape of neck, depth, or length of neck, shape of neck that make a prop unserviceable? Oh, there are, um, there, there are indeed um, uh, specifications for how much a propeller blade can be altered, um, and those appear in the propeller overhaul manual, and um, uh, from what I have seen, they tend to be quite generous. I mean... Um, I, I know on on my airplane the 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 specs are that the prop blades can be shortened by as much as a couple of inches without removing without uh, making the blades unairworthy um, as long as they're still in balance and so on. <clears throat> there are uh, written guidelines for uh, dressing out nicks um, and how uh you know how the 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 repair has to be radius and so on um mechanics in the field are very limited as to what they can do with propellers they can dress out nicks and so on but, but anything that is um much more than than just dressing out nicks or repainting uh, prop blades require that the that the propeller uh, be sent to a, a propeller repair station but the repair stations can do a tremendous amount of stuff. Uh, they have very wide latitude as to what they can do in, in repairing blades. Hmm. Cool. Uh, let's see here, a comment from Michael. Uh, Michael's a uh, FAA inspector. He says, um, in the case of the uh, pilot with the low tire, um, he should sign off the condition notice, but it is not regulatory to do so. Also, he adds, overhauls are mandatory for aircraft operated under Part 135 per the operation specifications. Correct. Um, everything I was saying was in the context of Part 91 operators. Um, part 135, uh, 129, 121 operators have <clears throat> um, uh, operation specifications that that which which is essentially a negotiated document between them and the FAA as as part of their holding their certificates um, and uh, and they have to comply with with what they promise to do in the uh, in in the operation specifications. It is not unusual for Part One Thirty Five operators to. Um, to obtain TBO extensions, um, but they have to ask for them and get them approved uh, by their principal maintenance inspector. They can't just go ahead and do it on their own recognizance the way Part 91 operators can. And what is a what's Part 135 operation? It's it's I, it's, it's basically charter um, commercial operation. It, char yeah, charter. This, well, it's. It's more than commercial operation because you could say a flight school is a commercial operation, but it's typically not part 135. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it, 
it's where you're operating a, a commercial operation for common carriage. Um, and there, there's, there's a lot of legal language to defining what it, what, what kind of operations require a part 135 certificate, but think of it as a, as a, as a, a charter kind of a operation. Gotcha. Carrying passengers for hire versus part 91, which is just flying for sport and recreation primarily. Uh, correct. But, <clears throat> but you can give flight instruction for hire and it still be part 91. So just the fact that money is changing hands doesn't necessarily mean it's part 135. Yeah. Hey, Paul's wondering, are props that have been polished able to be repainted by a mechanic without being removed from the aircraft? Uh, that's a question that's above my pay grade. I suspect that they can be painted, but um, but I, I I couldn't give an authoritative answer without doing some research. Mm -hmm. And certainly, painting is one of the things that 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 a, a AMP mechanic is authorized to do do to a propeller. Um, but um, in in general. Um, what 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 the the um, privileges and limitations for AMP mechanics says is that that, that AMPs <clears throat> may only do minor repairs to propellers and may do no repairs to instruments. Uh, other things they're pretty much uh, able to 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 do any kind of repairs. Um, if they're major repairs, they have to have. Uh, uh, they, they have to have approved data and they have to uh, file a, a 337 and have to have the work inspected by an IA. But in the case of propellers and instruments, there are special limitations <laughs> and mechanics are not permitted to, to perform any repairs to instruments. Only an instrument repair station may do that. And they're not uh, permitted to do anything beyond minor repairs to propellers. Only a uh, a, a propeller repair station can do major repairs or overhauls to propellers. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Don is wondering, how do you recommend how to handle the situation when a mechanic does a repair without authorization or any type of approval from the owner? Well, that, that uh, also is something that happens uh, quite a bit and it's very unfortunate. Um, and the, the answer is that the owner has to, um, set out, uh, well-defined limitations on the mechanic before he, he, he turns over the airplane to them and tells them what they're authorized to do and what they're not authorized to do. When we <clears throat> provide an airplane to a, to a shop for an annual inspection, we instruct them that they are authorized to perform the entire inspection and prepare <clears throat> a, uh, a discrepancy list and a set of recommended repairs and cost estimates, but then that they are not authorized to perform any repairs or to replace any parts uh, without explicit approval. Um, you know, if, if you take your car into a shop, all of that is, is basically required by uh, by 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 local by by state uh, automotive laws in just about every state of the union but when it comes to airplanes there aren't any laws like that protecting aircraft owners so the owner has to make it very clear um, as a matter of of contract with the shop what they're authorizing the shop to do and what they're not authorizing the shop to do um, <clears throat> and um, you know really professional shops will do that anyway. They, it's, it's, it's really pretty stupid for a shop to perform a repair on an airplane without the owner's authorization because they're setting themselves up for a dispute over the invoice if they do that. Um, but smaller shops do, do that sort of thing all the time. And of course there are disputes over invoices all the time. So the owner really has to protect himself by making it very, very clear what he's asking the shop to do and what he's directing the shop not to do without further approval from him. It seems to me you did a webinar on that subject uh, a little while ago. 
At least one, I'm sure. <laughs> At least one, yeah. It'd be a good thing to look back into the video archive and review that information if uh, anybody's interested in learning more about that. Okay, we're, we're getting kind of close to the end on the questions here, which is good because um, we had uh, Robert said, uh, please thank Mike for his presentation. Uh, uh, while being in discomfort, as was obvious, his presentations are always greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mike. Well, my, my pleasure. And yes, I, I am getting sorted to the end of my voice, unfortunately. So <laughs> it's probably good that you're running out of questions. Let's, uh, let's try Mark's here as one of the last ones. And uh, is an engine overhaul considered preventive maintenance? If so, is the shop that does the install the one who signs off to return the aircraft to service? Um, I that's an interesting question. An engine overhaul is not preventive maintenance from a regulatory standpoint. Preventive maintenance is <clears throat> basically a list of about three dozen tasks that uh, that an aircraft owner is allowed to do on his own recognizance that's set forth in Part 43, Appendix A sub C. Um, in, the, in the more global sense, I guess you could say an engine overhaul is preventive maintenance because preventive maintenance is, you know, in, in, in with capital letters is is uh, is maintenance that's done to, to prevent something from going wrong as opposed to maintenance that's done to respond to something that's gone wrong. <clears throat> but at least from a regulatory standpoint and the way we use those terms in aviation, um, an engine overhaul is not preventive maintenance. Uh, an engine overhaul. Um, is something, assuming that the engine doesn't have planetary gears and so on, is something that any a and mechanic is permitted to do under the regulations, although uh, I sort of wince when I, when I hear about engine overhauls being done um, other than and by, a, by an engine repair station. Um, but, uh, but any a and mechanic is permitted to do an overhaul. Um, I know of several aircraft owners who have overhauled their own engines under the supervision of ANP, and uh, aircraft owner can do anything he wants to as long as he can get an ANP to to supervise uh, and sign off the work. And it's a it's it's a very educational thing to do. Um, so I don't want to discourage uh, by any means aircraft owners from being as ambitious as they want to when it gets to maintenance. Um, but if it's something other than the three dozen things in uh, uh, Part 43 Appendix A sub C, um, then you, you have to find a, an A&P who is willing to be your supervisor and willing to sign off the work uh, when it's done. Okay, last question here from Bruce. Bruce says, uh, I replaced the baggage door seal on my Cessna with an FAA PMA part. Can I sign for return to service as owner pilot, or does this require an A and P? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> my take on that is that it, it is something that you, as an aircraft owner, could do as preventive maintenance um, because it's an inter interior furnishing part, and uh, Part Forty Three Appendix A sub C does allow aircraft owners to do. Uh, pretty much any, anything with non-structural inter interior furnishing repairs. So I think it is something you could do and sign off on your own recognizance without an A&P. If, if you, you know, have any question about how it should be done, then it's always best to consult a mechanic. But if it's something you're comfortable with, uh, that's an item I think that, that it could legitimately be classified as preventive maintenance under the regs. Cool. Hey, a um, couple comments here. Uh, Michael just says, hey, great job, Mike. You should be a Fed, but probably could not stand the pay cut. Well done. <laughs> and uh, Ken is saying, uh, Mike, uh, get well, go easy. And uh, Jeff, uh, thank you, Mike, for all your presentations. Well, thanks, guys. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure I could tolerate the amount of paperwork of being a Fed. That, that would be my big hang up. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill had a question. How much does all this apply to light sport aircraft? 
um, well, the you know the basic principles apply to light sport aircraft, um, but the, um, the first of all, when we talk about light sport aircraft, we can't properly talk about use the word airworthiness. Airworthiness is something that only applies to certificated aircraft. For non-certificated aircraft, including LSAs, we, we talk about condition for safe operation. That's why what you have to do once a year is called a condition inspection rather than an annual inspection. Um, there's differences in who's allowed to do it. For certificated aircraft, it requires an IA or, or a, uh, a certified repair station. Uh, for LSAs, um, the requirements are different as to as to who is allowed to do the condition inspections and and so on. But the basic principles of who's responsible for what, uh, I think, uh, remains remains consistent. All right, wonderful. Well, we had a good uh, presentation tonight, Mike. We're going to wrap it up a little bit early here. Questions have really wound down. We're going to give you a break on your voice there. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you uh, recovered enough to to do the presentation tonight. Please take a moment and share closing comments. Uh, okay, uh, I will. Um, as <clears throat> as usual, if you aren't already on my uh, um, email newsletter list. You can sign up. I would invite you to sign up at SavvyAviation.com. Um, up at the top of the page, there'll be a, a, a red link to to uh, to sign up for the newsletter. <clears throat> or if you hang on for the post webinar survey that that uh, Tim is going to put up at the end of this webinar, there's a checkbox that you can check, and we'll put you on the mailing list. Um, my uh, my book manifesto is uh, still available at Amazon, and I'm working on my second book on piston aircraft engines um, that is uh, is scheduled to be released uh, in time for Air Venture 2018. And um, if you're interested in participating in my book project, uh, you can go to my Patreon site, patreoncom aviator and uh, and and get involved in the process. And finally, I'll just um, go through the next three uh, first Wednesday of the month webinars that I'll be doing. <clears throat> um, the January webinar is entitled Liticophobia, which means the fear of being sued. We'll talk about the effect that the fear of being sued has on how um, people in aviation um, uh, act. It's uh, the, the the fear of litigation is a real scourge in this industry, and we'll we'll be talking about that in February. the the um, uh, The webinar is is entitled "What No Smoking Gun," uh, where we'll be talking about the fact that 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 uh, when we have a problem with an airplane and we 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 try to fix it. Um, we always would like to have start out with a really good diagnosis as to what the cause of the problem was, but sometimes we don't get it. And I'll, I'll, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about, about the situations where that happens. <clears throat> and finally, March, the March webinar called Making Metal Behave, we'll be talking about the different ways that, um, that we can alter the properties of of metal, um, we'll get into things like heat treating and cold rolling and shot peening and that sort of thing, and and how we can coerce metal to uh, uh, to become softer, harder, tougher, uh, springier than 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 it was otherwise. It, it, and, and those of you who are into into metallurgy and stuff, I think we'll find this kind of interesting. So uh, that's all I have, uh, Tim, and and uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody. Um, in 2018. Cool. 2018. Next time we'll speak. I'm really looking forward to March 7th, making metal behave. That sounds really interesting. Uh, that'll be a good one. A couple days after my birthday. So good birthday present, I guess. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, great webinar as always. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to tune in and and have some fun with us here with the webinars and uh, 
Thanks again so much, Mike, for volunteering your time to be with us. Always a pleasure. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, my pleasure, Tim, and good night, everybody. Thanks for coming.